Excellent. Okay. So in 1864, in Harper's New Monthly Magazine, the writer Edgar Holden published an article titled A Chapter on the Coolie Trade. The article is a rare first person account of a coolie mutiny that Holden witnessed aboard a voyage from Macau to Cuba. Coolie, as you are most likely aware, is a term used to describe an indentured laborer, typically from South, uh, of South Asian or East Asian descent, hired to work on a temporary basis. Describing the coolie trade as a gigantic wrong involving outrages against human liberty, Holden denounces it as an old form of slavery that has been instituted in the new community. Accompanying the text are several demand illustrations of Chinese movies and the actions that took place during the journey. The first image portrays a dark-skinned, semi-nude man kneeling subserviently on an elevated step aboard a ship. He seems to hover between land and sea, occupying an in-between ground. The coolie is being addressed by two bearded European merchants dressed in suits who stand on the right hand side. On the left, one of the crewmen stands aboard the ship, dressed in a loose jacket and short brimmed hat. His body leans towards the right as he pulls the ropes of the ship and guides our attention toward the kneeling coolie. Together with his gaze, he creates a diagonal line towards the merchants with the coolie sandwiched in the ambiguous middle. Along the left-hand side, there's also a row of Chinese men that await their turn at inspection. They are unidentifiable as coolies by their lack of clothing, dark skin, and cues, or single long braids that hang down from their backs. Dark hatch marks distinguish the colored workers from the ship's sails, the sea, and sky, and the European men. A division is made between the white European tradesmen and the dark-skinned colored laborer, the civilized and uncivilized, the men with power and those without. Although Holden expresses sympathy for the police, his account is clearly written from the perspective of someone above deck. The Chinese coolie largely remains a silent victim, located on the periphery of Cuban history and almost entirely absent from the visual archive. The voices of coolies are confined to the margins of literature. Images of Chinese coolies are few and far between. Despite their growing presence in Latin America, the Chinese were not represented in Latin American art from the 19th century, even when movements such as Postmodernismo, a genre that focused on the visual literary depictions of everyday people, was prevalent. Being neither black nor white, the Chinese were persistently viewed as outsiders, culturally and legally. The research I will present today on the visual representations of Chinese coolies in 19th century Cuba is greatly informed by two previous scholarly projects. As a Latin American art historian, one of my primary interests has been the forgotten 19th century. Flanked by the more well-known and lauded colonial and modern art periods, 19th century Latin American art has been traditionally considered inconsequential and transitional. It certainly was a period of political turmoil, as many Latin American countries would fight and win their independence from Spain in the 19th century. Cuba would be among the last, gaining their independence in 1898. But many nations formulated their national identities during the 19th century, and images were a crucial part of that construction. For example, in 1852, a group of Cuban writers and illustrators published a collection of essays titled Los Cubanos Pintados por Sí Mismos that described a variety of stock figures meant to represent Cuba's diverse populace. This album, inspired by European books about popular social types and trades, contributed to a transnational debate about what constituted a nation and who represented it. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm more interested in this expert. The other area of research that has informed this project is my study of the Chinese Afro-Cuban artist Wilfredo Lam. Acclaimed for his semi-abstract, fantastical, polymorphic paintings, scholarship has focused on Lam's art as a synthesis of Cubism, surrealism, and Afro-Cuban religious traditions, namely Sanhedrin. The jungle, for example, has often been described as representing the enslaved African rising amidst the sugarcane, the source of his oppression. However, I attest that in a country where Chinese Koolies and enslaved Africans work side by side on a sugar plantation, 
Lam also represents the experience of the thousands of violently treated Chinese laborers. Lam's painting can be understood as critiquing universal human repression. His unique pictorial vision appeals on a primordial level to the plight of all human suffering. Stemming from these interrogations, this paper poses and seeks to answer the following questions. How were Chinese coolies represented visually in 19th century Cuba? What can these images tell us about their roles and experiences in history? And how do these images inform our knowledge of the coolie trade and our memory of such history? After a brief discussion of the Chinese migration to Cuba, I will examine more fully the illustrations of coolies that were featured in Holden's essay in Harper's Magazine. I will then highlight several first-person testimonies given by coolies in the 1874 Chinese Commission Report, which eventually brought an end to the coolie trade. And lastly, I will analyze another group of little-known images of coolies published by an anonymous Chinese writer in 1875. The 19th century testimonies and illustrations of Chinese coolies condemned the savagery and cruelty of the European overseers, while simultaneously revealing that the coolies were not passive victims. The coolies demonstrated their agency, courage, direct resistance in the act of migrating with words and rebellion. Cuba was built on the European colonization and exploitation of indigenous African and Asian people. To have a Cuban consciousness, a phrase coined by anthropologist and scholar of Afro-Cuban culture, Fernando Ortiz, is to acknowledge and affirm the presence and contributions of the Chinese to the culture, history, and economy. By the 1840s, China, Cuba was the preeminent sugar producer in the world, surpassing its competitors Jamaica, Brazil, and Puerto Rico. To accommodate the global demand for sugar, Africans were enslaved and forced to work on the plantations. Between 1790 and 1867, Cuba enslaved 780,000 Africans, surpassing the number of 700,000 enslaved Africans that were brought to the entirety of Spanish America between 1520 and 1780. However, with the rise of 19th century abolition movements and anti slavery sentiment, Sugar plantation owners sought to supplement their labor needs with other sources. Between 1847 and 1873, approximately 150,000 coolies or indentured laborers were brought from China to Cuba to work on the sugar plantations under short term contracts. Known for being industrious, obedient, and knowledgeable about agriculture, the Chinese coolies settled in the areas of sugar called sugarcane cultivation, as seen here in this map. But beyond the scope of this paper, it should be noted Cuba was not the only Latin American country to receive coolie laborers during this period. Another 100,000 coolies were sent to to work in one. Chinese coolies arrived in Cuba during an ongoing slavery system. Slavery would not be abolished in Cuba until 1886. Cuba was the second to last nation in the Western Hemisphere to end slavery. Brazil was the last in 1888. In other countries like Jamaica and Trinidad, Cuba coolie labor was established after slavery had been terminated. The fact that the Chinese coolies in Cuba worked within the slavery system alongside enslaved Africans greatly impacted their experience. Regardless of their circumstances as voluntary laborers, Chinese coolies in Cuba experienced slave-like conditions. As argued by Evelyn Blue de Hart, despite the perception of the incorporation of free labor, the coolie system was a form of neo-slavery. Nevertheless, as Lisa Yun argues, coolie labor would mark the world transition from slavery to free labor, from pre-modern to modern production. Coolies were more cost effective than enslaved Africans. They were easier to obtain and cheaper to purchase, making the coolie trade extremely profitable. For example, from 1845 to 1850, the cost of an enslaved African was 335 pesos versus 125 pesos for a Chinese coolie. Many coolies were enticed by the tropical climate and economic opportunities in Cuba. In fact, unscrupulous recruiters or agents known as crimps procured gullible young men under false pretenses, lying about the harsh working conditions and their indentured servitude. They were lured into eight-year contracts with the possibility to be freed at the end of the term, 
But in reality, this was illusory, as most coolies became financially indebted to their masters, preventing their freedom. The worker was responsible for value added, such as clothing, loss of labor time due to sickness, and the inconvenience of finding a future replacement. Thus, after the eight-year term expired, if the laborer survived, he would still owe his master an amount impossible to repay. In 1860, regulations closed off the options for freedom and forced Chinese laborers into sequential slavery under recontracting rules. By the early 1860s, there were several public condemnations of the food trade, even as the business was becoming more financially lucrative. As previously mentioned, in 1864, Edgar Holden wrote about the Chinese flea trade and a mutiny that had taken place on a voyage five years earlier in 1859. I now turn to a fuller discussion of those illustrations. The mutiny occurred aboard the Norway, a cargo ship that was headed from Macau to Havana with 1,037 coolies and 60 crew members. Although the Chinese were often typecast as docile and submissive, Holden demonstrates that Chinese police also had a reputation for their intelligence and rebelliousness. In his article, Holden quotes an 1855 letter from an agent in Havana that describes the Chinese police as possessing a superior intelligence than a malicious and vengeful disposition. Images drive home this point. Accompanying this quotation is an image of an enraged coolie. His right arm is outstretched. Uh, the coolie is depicted in the act of striking an unseen opponent. His right arm is outstretched behind him, brandishing a cleaver, while his left arm is raised overhead, holding a flame torch. His cue swings backward wildly. The cue hairstyle was typical of Chinese men during the Qing Dynasty and demonstrated obedience to the regime. Although his face is in profile, we can see his fury and his animal-like features. He's dressed in short loose trousers, his feet and torso are bare. The negative space behind the figure is half filled with braided patch marks, evoking a rising anger from the floor to the brandishing torch. An image of the savage is moves. Prior to boarding the ships, the coolies were held in fil filthy barracks for barracks. Um, the Chinese, I'm sorry, the Chinese refer to them repeatedly as pig pens, and these are seen here on the lower right. The coolies were transported from the barracks to the ships via smaller boats called sampans, and those are seen in the image of that on the upper left there. The coolies were kept below deck on the main ship with the food, the water, and the supplies. Besides the 1,037 coolies, there were several other passengers, women and children included, that were on board the Norway, and they occupied the upper part of the cabin. Yes. So the sand, the, did the Norway carry the sampans, or did I hear that right, that the sampans are smaller boats? Yeah, the sampans were, so the Nor the big ship would have been held offshore and in the water, a little bit of away from shore, and they used the smaller boats, the sampans, to transport the coolies from the shore to the main ship. Did they bring the sampans with them? No. They, were they came used, from Cuba. They were just used to transport uh, in Macau. Oh, and so in Macau, the Norway would stay off shore, but in Cuba, the Norway would come in pretty close to shore. Yeah, and they have other boats that can do that. Similar, fun similar yeah. function. Exactly. This particular one is the one in Macau that's being illustrated. But yes, similar in depth. So, that's last my case. Um, two biracial interpreters from Havana were also on the voyage. Voyage, and they're seen in here in the lower left. Yeah. Interpreters are depicted fully clothed with loose jackets and trousers and wider bridge hats. Their features are dark and they have slim mustaches. Mm -hmm. Olden describes them as being half Chinese, half Portuguese, and notes that on board they set themselves apart from the imprisoned coolies. On the evening of the third day of the voyage, a violent incident occurred following a typical quarrel. One man was cut down. Fever. The wounded man and four other rioters were brought up from the lower deck. So, in preserving the peace, here you see one of the three rebels tied up in the wind. The rioters revealed that other coolies had been organizing a plot to overthrow the captain, 
Their plan was to tear down the temporary berths to create clubs and materials for building a fire under the hatch. And when the crew came forward to subdue the flames, the coolies would rush forward up the main hatchway. It was in choosing their leaders for the revolt that the dispute and incident occurred. In the illustration, a providential mischance seen here on the left, we see at the center of the composition the enraged coolie, brandishing that cleaver toward the unfortunate victim. On the floor lies a wounded coolie. Two white guards restrain some of the coolies by pulling their cues, a sign of cultural domination. It is raucous, it is chaotic. Besides the enraged coolie who is striking his opponent, the other coolies in the scene have either fallen or been subdued despite their greater numbers. The fully clothed European men show controlled actions while the semi nude coolies are revealed as frenetic and barbaric. Although Hogan denounced the coolie trade, he did describe the Chinese as barbarians, and these images depict them as feral and cruel. The riot was quelled for two days. On the third day, a flame shot up from below deck, and more chaos ensued. Rioters tried to force the hatch door open with cleavers stolen from the cooks. Pistols were shot. Coolies then swung lighted firebrands, hurling bolts and clubs at any faces that peered through the iron grates of the hatch. The crew threw tarpaulins over the forward hatches and streamed water to quench the fires. Smoke filled the ship, but the coolies wouldn't be deterred, yelling from below, continuing to fight against their captors. In the two images on the right, we see visualizations of these acts. In the upper image, you see crewmen attempting to close the hatch with a large rod. On the lower image, crewmen are firing down the hatchway, shooting at the coolies to subdue them. Some coolies were punished by being chained to that deck. Others were shot. And those are some of the illustrations you see on the left. The coolies' rebellion was foiled, and the captain and crew demanded that the ringleaders of the mutiny surrender. When one brave coolie refused, he dipped a stylus in the blood upon the decks and wrote his demands. He wrote 300 coolies to be allowed on deck at one time. They shall navigate the ship and take her to Siam, where a certain number may leave her, after which she shall be allowed to proceed on her course. No signals of any kind shall be made to attract attention of other vessels. The coolie riding in blood is lying on the floor on the left-hand side. Three other coolies with animal-like features are seated in a semicircle behind him, while two dead bodies are displayed in the foreground and draw our attention to that writer. The rebellious, courageous act of writing these demands out of the blood of his fellow coolies is accentuated by the solemnity of the scene. It is a symmetrical, balanced composition. The circle of coolie bystanders flanks a vertical post and calling a blogging post, creating a parenthesis around the figures in the foreground. Although it was calm for the next few days, there was another insurrection on the last night. In the last illustration, on the lower deck, we see coolies continuing to fight and demonstrating resilience. They swing their firebrands, angry and agitated, a far cry from the stereotype of the subservient, submissive Chinese man. Instead, these images typecast them as rebellious, but also uncivilized and brutish. The mutiny was eventually quelled, and the next day the coolies asked to be quelled. 130 people died on the voyage, 70 were killed or died from wounds during the insurrection. A large portion of the rest died from an epidemic of dysentery, well, which struck the boat while awaiting disembarkation. These 13 illustrations are unique in that they are one of two groups of images that depict coolies brought from Cuba in the 19th century. They demonstrate the willpower, strength, and barbaric nature of the Chinese coolies. Okay, quotes, barbaric. They were not submissive of that or docile. They repeatedly fought back and sought justice. They were insurgent and threatened the colonialist world order. Mutinies and tragedies of war coolie ships occurred regularly. In fact, uh, in one out of 11 voyages. Although many more Chinese died than Europeans during these rebellions, fear was instilled among the captains of these ships. Because these mutinies occurred in between territories, in the middle passages of forced labor around the world, 
These stories of struggle have not been studied and have dissolved into the vast seas like so many have died. Although most mutinies aboard coolie ships were subdued, there were remarkable instances where the coolies managed to usurp control of the ship. In one case, in 1868, 50 coolies seized a Prussian ship, murdered the crew, and returned to China. Two principal events led to Chinese liberation from the sugar plantations. The Wars of Liberation and the historic investigation of cooling conditions in Cuba by a commission sent from China in 1874. The Wars of Liberation, including the Ten Years' War, the Little War, and the War of Independence, helped the Chinese escape indentured servitude. Many Chinese laborers enlisted in the wars to find freedom. The Chinese greatly contributed to securing Cuba's independence. Chinos Mambises, or Chinese freedom fighters, joined fellow enslaved Africans and free blacks in the first struggles to overthrow Spanish colonial rule. Between 2,000 and 7,000 Chinese participated in the wars. Today, in Havana's Chinatown, a monument consisting of a granite obelisk commemorates the Chinese soldiers who sacrificed their lives. Inscribed on, inscribed on a plaque are the words spoken by independence leader Gonzalo de Quesada, there was not one Cuban Chinese deserter, not one Cuban Chinese traitor. In 1874, a Chinese commission led by Chen Lanpen, the head of the Chinese educational mission in the US, arrived in Cuba to document and expose the inhumane treatment of the Chinese migrant laborers. The culminating report eventually led to the cessation of the trap. Later, the U.S. barred Chinese immigration to the shores. Migration to the Americas. New technologies replaced coerced labor on the plantations, leading to renewed profitability in the sugar industry. Today, it is images of the Chinese freedom fighter and the Chinese merchant or grocer that are more well known than that of the coolie. The coolie is a distant historical figure that was surpassed in national memory by the wars of independence and the eventual termination of the trade around a century and a half ago. The Chinese who survived and remained in Cuba from the 1870s forward had more physical, occupational, and social mobility uh, and became more enmeshed in Cuban culture. Lisa Yoon's study is the first to examine the 2,841 coolie testimonies that were gathered for the 1874 Chinese Commission report. Unlike slave narratives, the voices of the coolies are largely unknown. But as will become evident, coolie testimonies served as forms of resistance. The testifiers were Chinese laborers from Havana, Matanzas, and Santa Clara. These were the main sites of sugar plantations and ingenios, or sugar mills, and included the largest populations of Chinese and Africans. Testimonies reveal coolies included highly skilled and educated workers, scholars, teachers, craftsmen, tailors, doctors, and merchants. Approximately 17% were farmers, over 80% were not. The diversity of the coolies' occupations challenges predominant assumptions of the low socioeconomic background of the Chinese labor forces. In the report, several testimonies stand out for their first-hand descriptions of the deception and violence experienced by the coolies. For example, many doctors were recruited to care for the sick on coolie ships, but upon arrival were sold or tricked into signing a contract they could not understand. The testimonies also disclose the presence of young laborers, some abducted as young as eight or nine years old. One boy, Chen Afu, recalled, somebody kidnapped me to a pig building in Macau when I was 11. They gave me a contract, but I didn't understand the meaning of it. Brutality was commonplace. Many police testified their ears or fingers were cut off by their overseers. Coolies divulged the violence and cruelty they witnessed, including the numerous tortures, killings, and suicides. Many of the first type petitions appeal orally and emotionally like poetry. The lyrical testimonies evoke emotionally intense imagery. 
One petition states, thousands of words are under the sweep of our brushes, but they are too many to put down and read. Whips lash our backs, shackles chain our bodies. The young and strong can merely live with starvation. The old and weak die with unfrighted long. From now on, if we remain alive, we will be cold and hungry men. If we die, we will be ghosts with the start. A group of 130 degrees, including seven women, describe in verse, what kind of crime have we committed to deserve being chained when we repair the roads? What kind of deed have we done to deserve being stoned when we walk the street? We are humiliated, but who can we appeal to? Food is no better than plantain and corn. Person is no better than ox and horse. Pause for a moment and they lash and reprimand us. Stop for a rest and ensure we lock us up. We are birds in a cage that cannot fly with wings. Fish in a net that cannot swim in a deep lake. Do you, can you, you when you hear them repairing the road, is this not in Cuba, Havana? In the different in, in other uh, parts of Afghanistan, with Cuba as well, not just Havana. not just Havana. How uh, and this is the late eighteen hundreds. This is um, the mid yeah mid eighteen hundreds. Mid to late eighteen hundreds. The report comes out in eighteen seventy four. So this is you know several decades within the middle of the nineteenth century. Do you how do you picture the roads in, in Cuba at that point? At that time, you mean in terms of materials or materials, width, how many there were, um, how well developed they are, were? So, I, I don't have an exact answer for you, but what the testimonies reveal that the Chinese were being brought over to do the labor um, of the, the sugar cane cutting, but also several that were employed to create roads and eventually railroads later. Um, so they were working under, you know, forced conditions. And these are testimonies that um, I have one more to share with you that um, were captured in this Chinese report that brought an end to that food trade. That exact testimony brought an end. This, yeah, so there were over 2,800 2,841 testimonies that were captured in that Chinese report and eventually led to the cessation of the trade. So what I'm quoting here, I'll bring up the next one, are just excerpts, right, from these testimonies um, to share with you their voices uh, and what they were saying personally about these experiences that they were forced to undergo. That's great. Yeah, so suffering and captivity are repeatedly evoked by the metaphor of birds being caged. So Wrenches and the author of Petition 41 writes about the smallness of human life, despair, and the desire for freedom. The beach is so wide and boundless that a single person cannot be seen. Seawater surrounds the city. Trees grow wildly and form a canopy. Now I try to gulp down my sobs. In this dense forest and remote mountains, thousands of people are being whipped. The ocean is boundless and the sea is vast. I could not escape even if I had wings on my back. I am like a rotten tree, which does not have any leaves or branches in this world. I wonder where good things will ever come from than just waiting for my death to come. So the Cooley testimonies akin to enslaved Africans narratives were, as Lisa Dunn argues, writing into history of the previously suppressed. Coolies, despite being exploited and disposable, reveal their anger, courage, and resilience to free So in the last section, I'm going to show you some images from an 1875 publication published in China. So in 1875, an unprecedented, unsigned pamphlet titled The Illustrated Say <laughs> 
So this publication was published by Cantonese publisher. Uh, this is the only other 19th century publication besides Holden's and Harper's Magazine to illustrate multiple images of the coolies in Cuba. Though, as we will see, the representation is quite different. Through 42 striking images, the work relates the tragic fate of the coolies and reprehends this new form of slavery. 36 of the stories and images refer to coolies in Cuba, while five pertain to coolies in Peru. The anonymous author seeks to inform his readership as to the dangerous trade and spur the Qing imperial court to rethink its foreign policy and protect its nationals. Beginning in 1875, Living House was first distributed as individual handouts in the streets of Canton and Hong Kong. Later, the pamphlets were reunited into one volume under the current title. In each of the 42 stories, the illustration occupies the front of the page while the text is printed on the back. The format is meant to invoke suspense. The reader first encounters the visual image. Curiosity peaked, the reader must turn the page to read the accompanying explanation and narrative. Each of the stories chronicles the name, age, and village of a coolie before he departed from China his method of recruitment, and the living conditions in which he finds himself. <clears throat> They're not explicitly stated, the stories are loosely based on two investigative reports undertaken by Chen Lanbin and Yong Ming. Chen Lanbin, the first Chinese ambassador to the U.S. during the Qing dynasty, had led the aforementioned 1874 Chinese Commission report. His colleague, Yong Ming, investigated coolie labor in Peru. Wing was the first Chinese student to graduate from American University, Yale, and later appointed assistant minister to London at the embassy. Details are vague enough, however, that neither of the two men can definitively be designated as authors of this pamphlet. It appears that they wished to remain anonymous to avoid punishment and retaliation by the government. Title of the Living Hells, the pamphlet pointedly condemns the coolie trade, equating its Western tortures with Chinese infernal punishments. The pamphlet, in fact, drew its inspiration from the moral book, the Jane Calendar Manuscript, which visualizes the horrific punishments given to sinners in Buddhist hells. The author meant his illustrations of Cuba and Peru to be seen as terrestrial hells, not spiritual ones. The pamphlet flip was very popular from publication, but had short-lived success when it was banned by Spanish representatives in the Qing Empire in 1877. The Spanish feared acts of violence against the West. Long lost, only eight Chinese copies survived. Knowledge of this publication was kept hidden for over a century. Recently, in 2018, the pamphlet was translated into French by the historian Pierre Macbeth. That's what you see here with the French cover. So I've selected multiple images to share with you that will serve as a point of comparison to the illustrations from Harper's Magazine. For the most part, the images of living hells emphasize the horrid conditions and tortures the coolies experience, not their rebellious barbaric behavior. The text refers to the coolies as piglets in relation to the barracks they were, that were referred to as pigsties. And the reason they were called pigsties is because the coolies were fed in the same way as pigs via a big wooden trench. In the first image of the pamphlet, we see three male figures who gesture and converse uh, amicably. The rightmost figure points towards an entrance, leaving the two figures behind him. The coolie can be identified by his long queue. The text reveals that Wu Aqing is 42 years old and comes from Chaoyan in Canton province, where he is a farmer. Due to some civil unrest in his hometown, he is forced to move to another village. There, he is approached by a man who advises him to go to work abroad for a monthly salary of $30. Enticed by this potential income, Aqing follows him to an agency of piglets, where he signs a contract, then boards a ship. Upon arrival in Havana, he is sold to a sugar plantation owner where his crew master whips him daily. Out of the 50 unfortunate men who accompanied him on the voyage, 25 committed suicide. 
Ache feels he is better off suffering than returning to his native village, humiliated and useless. In image three, on the right hand side, we have an enchained Kuhubi being dragged towards a ship. While one man pulls him via the chain around his neck, another man raises a large weapon to strike him from behind. The coolie, despite his feet being bound, raises his head in arm in protest. The large Kuhubi ship awaits in the background with another crimp visible on board. The illustration reveals that some coolies were deceived, baited, and taken against their will. The text tells us the coolie's name is Huang Dun, he's 50, and he is from Fujian, a southeastern Chinese coastal city. He also works in the fields. When he was walking along an isolated path, he was suddenly tied up by four individuals and penned in the barrack room with 20 others. He was so stubborn, he was struck with a baton and forced on the word. He was then sold to a sugar plantation where his suffering became intolerable. Fanga reflects on how the group recruiters could commit these terrible acts against their own people. The living hells condemns not just the Western powers that ban the trade, but also the Chinese for enabling this deception and torture of their own people. The Chinese government is implicated in these crimes. In the latrines for prison, we see a depiction of a latrine that was used as a prison. A recruiter wearing a hat crouches on the wooden planks covering the latrine. The coolie is visible below, down here. The black dots that surround him suggest the filth that disseminates from this pigsty. The 32-year-old coolie named Lin Alian from Guangdo was lured by a man from Macau to sign a contract to work in foreign lands. When he refused, he was pushed into a prison latrine, the name for this giant cesspool. Up to their shoulders and excrement, the coolies had no choice but to sign the contract. Given, according to the text, out of all the Chinese who were naively there, less than one to two percent consented. Next two illustrations demonstrate cultural ignorance. In the image on the left, the queue cut by force, a 45 year old Chen Aji is beaten down while his queue is cut forcefully by the recruiters. For Chinese men from the countryside, the queue demonstrates their loyalty and fidelity to their parents. Without it, they lose their dignity. In the next illustration on the right, several coolies, upon losing their queues, are forced to jump into the sea because of their lost honor and humiliation. The next several images show specific tortures and punishments, the horrors of the living hell. In debt repayment turns to deceit, Chang Rongli is forced on a ship to Cuba to repay his debt without the opportunity to alert his family. Once on the sugar plantation, he is forced to do heavy labor. Due to his inability to carry large loads, he is stripped, tied to a column, and whipped. Lashings and blood are visible on his skin. Right hand side, 33 year old Liang Ayu is punished by having his ear cut off or taking a break from his tasks. He is later imprisoned for four months without justification, where he becomes a ghost of the prison, signifying his demise. The image on the left shares affinities with imagery from the Jade Calendar manuscript. The Jade Manuscript was a religious tract that circulated in various versions in 19th century China. It has Buddhist and Taoist features and describes the hells that await sinful and bad people. Image 32 also draws specifically from the punishment suffered by Buddhist sinners. In inhalation in a sugar cauldron, two coolies have met their demise. The large circular cauldron dominates the right hand side of the composition where two figures are immersed upside down, their legs flailing in the air. The image refers to the religious iconography of the Chinese underworld and more specifically to the cauldron of oil where sinners were boiled, revived, and boiled again. This is similar to the boiling oil pots of hell in the Jade Calendar manuscript. Dead coolies were not given proper burials. In fact, the bones of dead coolies were used as materials to refine sugar. In refining sugar with human bones, a figure is throwing a leg, a foot, into a furnace. Another figure tends to a heap of skeletal bones. 
The diagonal line of the furnace echoes the line of the dismembered leg and bifurcates the image into two. The roaring flames take up half of the composition, emphasizing the fiery hell that was endured by the priests. This was particularly cruel and unjust, as a proper Chinese burial would require a body to be kept intact and return to be buried in the sacred land. This was a punishment so awful and notably was not portrayed in the Chinese power manuscript. These images, which depict blatant torture and violence inflicted on the police, were informed by the testimonies from the Chinese Commission report and would assist in bringing the treaty to an end. The moralizing pamphlet personalized the trade by relating the stories of named individuals and giving written and visual representations to the police. It raised awareness of the injustices of the Kuli trade and the racial discrimination and brutal treatment of Chinese citizens abroad. It reprimanded Chinese intermediaries and the government for being complicit in the trade and not protecting the citizens. What better way to garner support and stop the trade than through the dissemination of horrified, detailed, visual images of Kuli torture? Equating the terrestrial hells with spiritual hells, the author's condemnation was effective and painted. Instead of Harper's magazine's emphasis on the Kuli's rebelliousness and animality, the Chinese publication highlights their suffering. In contrast to the varied shading and gradations of black and white in the images in Harper's magazine, which notably distinguished the color being burned, the illustrations of the living cow do not portray such distinctions in skin tone. Instead, markers of difference are emphasized by clothing and actions. Although we must acknowledge the artist's subjectivity and agendas, the images provide a visual record of the Chinese police expanding our knowledge and understanding of their experiences. Who favor played a major role in reshaping Cuba's sugar economy and its existing systems of production. And the amplified presence of the Chinese in Cuba challenged existing paradigms of race and nation. Cuba was no longer strictly black and white. The growing Chinese population forced a reconsideration of this traditional binary vision of society and complicated notions of what constituted Cuban national identity. As seen in their testimonies and in these illustrations, the police persevered despite the horrific circumstances they were forced to endure. The groups of illustrations I brought to light today provide us with varying representations of groups of a group of people that were largely erased from Cuba's history and sensitization. Excluded from the official narrative of what constituted the black map of Cubanness in the 19th century. Chinese Cubans have slowly emerged from the margins in select ways. I cite two present day ish examples in literature and painting. In the 2003 novel, Monkey Hunting, Christina Garcia tells a multi generational story of a family that traverses the globe from China to Cuba to Vietnam to the US. It begins with Chen Pang, a man who is tricked into leaving China to pursue wealth and happiness in the tropical island of Cuba, only to find himself trapped into indentured servitude, a coolie who is whipped and tortured as he labors on Cuba. His tenaciousness is seen when he hurls a sharp stone during a thunderstorm like a cruel criollo overseeing seer killing him instantly and burning the respect of his fellow coolies and slaves. His resilience is visible in his escape from the vintage. Chen has eventual union with a previously enslaved mulatto woman named Patricia, produces several multiracial and multicultural children. Torres Garcia later describes them into the individuals with multi Understandings and interconnections between Chineseness and Humanidad permeate the Chinese Cuban artist Pedro Eng Herrera's compositions. In Paradise Between Two Cultures, Eng Herrera depicts both the Cuban and Chinese flags hanging above recognizable features of the Cuban and Chinese landscape. 
In the foreground, we see the esplanade and seawall that stretches along the Cuban coast. Located horizontally along the composition are the fortresses of the 16th century Castillo Morro and the 18th century Castellania. In the background of Aang's painting, we see the sprawling Great Wall of China. The wall and mountains disappearing in and out of the clouds. Both are recognizable and popular landmarks of their respective nations and notably served as elements of protection. Ben Herrera's painting highlights the interconnectivity of Chinese Cuban history and culture. As we move forward decolonizing our respective disciplines, it is important that we extirpate from the margins and bring to the page and the canvas the voices, images, and transnational histories of migrants and marginalized groups. What is the Cuban population in, or sorry, what is the Chinese population in Cuba now? Well, that's a good question. I don't have exact numbers. Many Chinese um, left uh, with the communist revolution. Um, so the numbers are, are have dwindled um, or they uh, integrated with the local population. So exact numbers are hard to find. Um, in a recent trip, um, the once very thriving Chinatown, um, you didn't see recognizable people of Chinese descent. Um, so, um, there was the, uh, I think maybe it was the very first revolt when uh, some of the coolies in, in, in the in the below deck um, painted a, a ransom demand in blood and, and asked to be transferred to Siam. That's that's fairly close to China. That's Thailand, right? And and, and a lot closer to, to China than to uh, Cuba. Yeah, they're being asked to go back to, to Asia. Um, I don't know much about why they you know, wrote that up just because that text is literally in Holden's article. Um, so again, one takes it with a grain of salt, right? He's doing, he's recounting a story um, that he witnessed, um, but certainly he's, he's telling a story, right? So we're, I'm sharing with you those, those words from through his voice, yeah. So I, I, I found myself wondering if, um, if maybe, they plan to, you know, commandeer the effectively commandeer the vessel to Siam right from the very beginning. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so hard to know, right? But you can imagine that with so many um, Chinese there against their will, right, that there would have been plans to to try and take for control of the ship. Um, and as I mentioned, there's been you know, some research. One out of eleven, you know, ships at the time had mutants. Right, so it definitely was a thing, and, and you know, few um, were successful. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I could find a lot of parallels with the people that I have found and discovered here at Cornell. Okay. Um, for instance, my housemate, um, he, his parents are Cantonese, and he was born in Venezuela. So you see this um, multi-hyphenated identity yeah. uh, with, with his existence, and he often questions whether or not he should be considered or consider himself even Hispanic or Latino um, because of those sort of contradicting identities. Uh, a country where he was born in the West versus his lineage in the East. Um, so I was, I was curious as to whether there were any sort of uh, coolier Chinese nationalist movements within Cuba or any other Latin American country, where you see this sort of heightened sense of Chinese nationalism given their precarious and uh, unfortunate circumstances, uh, where they try to insert themselves into this new narrative of uh, just immigrants and indentured servants. Yeah, I mean, so Cuba, the, the Chinese find escape through the wars, right? Mm -hmm. Through like, fighting first for Cuba's independence. Mm -hmm. And that becomes their, their way out. And in addition to this, you know, report now, the Chinese report, and coming to, bringing to light all of this horror, right? Um, 
they were also finding escapes through the through the course of the um, There's a there's a later you know wave of Chinese migration to Cuba when things open up a little bit. I mentioned in the 1880s, late 1800s, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act and, and numbers dwindle. But event that in the 20th century, early 20th century, there's another opening up, so to speak, of migration. A lot of Chinese come to work in the world at that point. Yeah. Um, but you know, your friend is is uh, you know not the only one, right? So he he may feel like he is, but he's not. And I would encourage him to use multi hyphenated identities. You yeah. know, no reason why you can't use them all. He literally just texted me last night. He was like, "Guys, I googled it. I am Hispanic." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, and we were like, "Yeah, we agree." Like he definitely had this sort of cultural upbringing uh, that made him feel like he belonged to that certain place until when he grew up and was sort of able to realize that he's just still being treated as the other within Venezuela, um, specifically as like a target for cultural racism, stuff like that. So um, it's definitely a difficult, difficult history and carries a lot of weight. Just like seeing the pictures almost cartoon-like in their design, but at the same time, you you can't help but see these things transcending. Like they're very visually like like they just represent exactly what's going on. They they don't try to be around the bush. Or yeah, and actually, I didn't talk too much about this, but you know, there's there's a lot of uh, anti Asian discrimination, anti Chinese discrimination in Latin America. Um, we know all about the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and with recent events, but it's uh, something that people just came back and we like, still are. It's the first thing that's other. Yeah. I wanted to ask um, about the Cuban state policies towards the Chinese population from the government. Um, Especially with the turn of the independ independence in, 18, in the end of the 19th century, and then the war with the US, and then the Cuban Revolution of 1959, and the new state that were cre was created in Cuba. How were the policies of plus kind of two, these two different kinds of governments, like the Batistas regime and then the Castro's regime towards the Chinese population? And also, I wonder. Who were the first uh, Chinese Cuban artists? Uh, like in the early times, maybe in the 19th century or the 20th century? Uh, it's very interesting. Okay, so in terms of the first question, um, there, so there were many Chinese who stayed in Cuba during the Communist Revolution and were active um, members of the Communist Party. So actually, Pedro de Nguera, who I, I showed his painting, um, he was an active communist and part of who fought for the Muslim. So there, there were definitely um, Chinese um, that stayed and supported the Muslim. So they didn't all exact uh, or leave, right? Uh, many left because they had uh, stores, right? They had businesses that were taken from the government. Um, and so many Chinese left, but I, I just want to say that some Chinese did stay, and there were Pedro and Pedro, he has a photograph. Um, of himself, where he's very proudly showing his comments. Um, in terms of Chinese Cuban artists, so of course the most well known is Lupe Lam. Um, you know, in the 19th century, to be honest, um, I, I don't know if they were, they were indentured laborers, right? Still, right? And if, if they were getting any independence, they were fighting the wars, they were in China. Dedicated their lives to art. Uh, Lam is probably among the earliest, I guess I would say, because his, um, you know, his father came to Cuba um, in the late 19th century, probably not as a cool, not as cool, I should say. Um, and um, Lam was born, you know, in the early 1902, maybe the early 20th century. Um, and then there have been others that have made some recognition. Laura Fong, for example, is, is one that comes to mind. Um, um, there have been, um, in the last, I would say, three, four years, exhibitions, like artists at museums, 
that are high, you were showing some to me, but that are sh highlighting um, the, um, the artists that have these Asian paintings in Latin America. So more and more are coming to light as some as the scholarship is growing. Question from Professor Byfield. Thank you for this fascinating talk. Although some were kidnapped, could you say a bit more about developments in China that contributed to Chinese culture? Also, your Chinese women in the So, great questions. Um, okay, so in terms of, you know, we think we don't know much about the Chinese people's lives prior to them arriving, and even then, you know, what I share with you is, is limited. Um, there is a lot of unrest in China um, at the at the time, a lot of poverty, um, and many um, that well, the men that were lured um, were experiencing um, difficult times in in their country, and they were being very much enticed by the, the, the land of opportunity. Right, so there, there was famine. There were, you know, rebellions and wars and such. So there was a, I think, a desire to even. And many of the police that come are coming from the southern coast of China. Right, they're on the coast, closer to the, the transportation, so to speak. Um, in terms of women, there's very little that I know and that I can even, um, research to uncover the. The presence of women, I mentioned one of the testimonies included the voices of seven women. Other than mentioning seven women were included, there's not much more known. They were not brought over as um, wives in the same way that Japanese women were. So you do think the picture bride and the stories that you hear, particularly in Peru, um, with Japanese migrants bringing their picture bride wives over, it seems that happened. Um, uh, or Japanese populations in this 19th century situation, um, the women were not um, migrating in the same way. So there's very little, there's very little to know. There's more to more to talk about. And definitely some like similarities with Brazil because mm -hmm. during the early periods of colonization in Brazil, women were not even allowed. So most of the colonizers would miscegenize and like mix with the indigenous people. Correct. Yeah, within the the location of colonization. So it's like, yeah, a lot of parallels yeah. there, with like women sort of migrating in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then later on, upon arriving to said country, like they realize, oh, those are my husband's children and they don't look anything like <laughs> So, right. yeah. Yeah, and, and Cuba is saying, saying like the, the Chinese men tended to mix and marry with um, the African. Yeah. So um, like, for example, it's like in the book that we'd like to know about the clothing customs of these fully people in the time, you know, in the context of Almost a slavery and um, false laborers during the time, but also, you know, clothing is usually a certain important way to assist in the decolonization. Who was that for the police, uh, labor workers, and also for the origin of people that overcome that uh, stage of uh, Chinese, even so in China, I mean, like in the early uh, 20th century, and that was. Clothes and etc. Mm -hmm. for those populations, and maybe about popular culture, music, and some tradition that, like Chinese traditions, but that definitely probably combine with Cuban and Caribbean mm -hmm. traditions, and maybe with African traditions. Yeah, so, so, uh, in terms of clothing, um, I think in the 19th century, what we know, I guess. Not a lot of information, scant information, but what we see, you know, in the depictions, right, from the Western perspective, they're half nude, right? Um, <laughs> in the Chinese um, illustrations, they wear this kind of clothing. I think you're probably referring to more traditional Chinese garments that would be distinguished. Um, there's certainly, you know, um, as in many, probably every Latin American capital city, there are in the Chinatown, right? So Chinatowns become these really um, 
vibrant uh, places where there are associations um, and businesses that are led in, in, by Chinese uh, owners. Um, there are festivals, right? They maintain their traditions. Your question about the synthesis of Chinese and African um, is a really interesting one. And one thing that I've uncovered, um, um, you know, is that in San Maria, right, which we traditionally think of as Afro-Cuban, um, there are Chinese um, practitioners, spiritual leaders of San Maria, right? So that um, some research has uncovered that there's, there are Chinese, there's Chinese synthesis, right, with um, San Maria, which is really fascinating to think about, right? Um, and that there are Balalaos, right, that are Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, I have, I want to do more with that, but um, uh, it's fascinating to, to look into and to think about. So I would imagine there are many other areas where that's what it comes to mind. Another question, which is, I noticed the highly metaphoric language of the testimonials, which makes them more powerful and tragic. This is more of a comment than a question. Please feel free to comment. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I, I, I think of it as poetry, right? There's something so emotional and wrought, and um, I absolutely agree. It makes it more powerful. Um, I don't, you know, the I, I mentioned I think some of the connections with, you know, being bird, birds without wings or fish without being able to swim, right? There are a lot of those um, you know, parts within the, within their testimonies. Um, why? I don't know, um, to be honest. Um, but I agree, it makes them accountable. It makes them more emotional, um, and I certainly. I, I, I think there are connections there um, with some of Wong's work um, as well, and being exposed to some of those characters, the poetic and the testimonies. So. I don't often see like those primary records from, I mean, granted it was a little later in time, but still we, we don't really see those sort of, yeah, like those primary sources. Right. Yeah. Coming from the people who were brought to these, right. you know, very bizarre and different, yeah. different places. Yeah, and forced situations, right? You know, you don't you always hear from the victim, right? Or no. the people who are oppressed. Um, and so, this Lisa Young's um, book on these testimonies is extremely important. You know, she really analyzes those testimonies, and I think it's important to share them wherever I go. So, yeah. I like to quote them. Because um, they do think they're powerful. I find it interesting that they were also described as like very like superiorly intelligent, mm -hmm. as you said, um, and that's like literally evident in the way they're sort of dealing with and conceptualizing their situation. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we assume that they're all farmers, right? Yeah. Um, and that's as I quoted, only seventy percent were farmers, and the rest were all from all sorts of trades. And so you see that also, as you say, in the Okay, good everyone. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your